Okay, welcome to Math 1107, Introduction to Statistics. Today we're focusing on Chapter 1, which is your basic ideas. Um, these ideas are some of the main ideas that you'll need in order to be successful in the course. Alright, so what is statistics? Statistics is basically the science of data. It's procedures for collecting, describing, and drawing conclusions from information. Um, it's basically just looking at data, um, analyzing it, drawing conclusions from it, um, and using it to kind of get an idea of what's going on in an entire population. So we have two different things. We have a population, we have a sample. Your population is the entire collection of individuals, is everyone that you're looking to get information from, whereas your sample is a subset of that population. Um, so it's like a smaller version of that population, and we use that to actually collect the data on. Now, again, your population is every single person. It's the entire collection. And a lot of times that's typically hard to collect data on. For instance, if I want to collect data on KSU students, maybe um, the average amount of classes that they take, I would it would, it would be kind of unrealistic to take the entire school and analyze that for the entire school. There's thousands of students here and it wouldn't be realistic for me to sit there and try to collect this data from every single person. Instead, what I would do is I would get a sample or take a sample of the school, maybe 100 or 200 students, and analyze the data with that sample. Now, once I get the information from that, from that sample, if I chose my sample accurately or chose my sample well enough, I can use that sample to make inference on the population. So this picture down here pretty much tells it all. You have your whole population. Within that population, you have this sample. And from this sample, we collect the data. And then once we collect the data, we use it to make inference back onto the entire population. So we're finding out information about the entire population, even though we didn't look at the entire population. So with that being said, we really need to focus on uh, ensuring that we actually know how to get a good sample. Your sample is everything. So we have a couple of different um, sampling methods um, that we're going to talk about for a little bit in this PowerPoint. The first sampling method is a simple random sample. A simple random sample basically ensures that every single person or every single group of people have the same chance of being chosen. Typically, you see this when you put everyone's name in a hat and you draw up maybe five, ten names, however many you want for your sample. Um, I know that sounds kind of elementary, but that will yield you a simple random sample. If I wanted to take a sample from this classroom, I'll put all 72 of you guys in a hat. Maybe I only want two, 20 students, so then I'll pull out 20 slips of paper. Um, that will ensure that everyone had a fair chance of being, of being picked. I don't want to be biased. I don't want to, you know, unintentionally pick all girls or unintentionally pick all boys. I want to make sure I'm being fair, so I put everyone in that hat and I draw their names out. Another way of doing it is using a random digits table, which you can find um, in the back of your textbook or on your online textbook. Um, basically, you give everyone a number with a random digits table. You give everyone a number, and then you go to the table, and you just read off in a row what numbers you want to pick. So I would number all of you guys 1 to 72, and then I will go to the random digits table, and I pick off number 1, number 5, number 10, and I just read it in the list. Again, ensuring that I'm not being biased. Whatever number's on that list from the table, that's the number that I use. Lastly, we have a random number generator. And again, these aren't the only ways. These are just some of the ways to get a random sample. But a random number generator is very convenient because it uses technology. You can do this on your phone. You can do this on your calculator. You can do it using Excel. Basically, again, just like with the random digits table, you give everyone a number, and then you have your random number generator spit out however many numbers you need. So if I wanted to pick 10 people out of this class, well, I'd have the random number generator spit out 10 numbers. Whatever 10 numbers it pull, spits out, those are the numbers that I'm actually going to use for my sample. So again, here's the entire population in green, and I get my little samples in blue um, using either names in a hat, random digits table, or random number generator to get a fair sample. The next one we have a sample of convenience. A sample of convenience is a sample that um, was done 
by the researcher where it was convenient to the researcher. In other words, if I want to do a study on all KSU students, a convenient sample for me may be to just, just to sample my classes. Like, I don't want to have to go out there and, and you know, find people and number everybody and figure out whose number is who and then use those people. No, the easiest way for me would be to uh, just sample the people in my classroom. Now, depending on the type of study that I'm doing, that could yield or lead to a, a lot of bias. Um, if I was doing a study on um, how well students enjoy statistics, well, if I only study my students, it's not really how well you enjoy statistics, it's how well they enjoy my statistics class. And so that sample of convenience is not necessarily a good way to create a sample. Typically, this is frowned upon, and people don't really people don't really use it. And again, they don't use it because it wasn't purposeful. I, it was just easy. And so we don't want to just do stuff that's easy. We want to do stuff that's accurate and that's going to yield us the best sample to give us information on that population. All right, so again, we do have those problems with the samples of convenience or a convenient sample. Um, again, just to sum that all up, it's just easy. And so it, it was it was not purposeful. It wasn't like we did it to help the study or to um, get better results or anything like that. We're doing it because it was easy. And again, that's not necessarily the best way to do it because it leads to bias in your sample. Next, we have a stratified sample. I actually like stratified sample. It's a great way to ensure that you get different types of people into your into your sample. Basically, with a stratified random sample, you break your population up into groups. Um, one great way to look at it is like, here we have a red group, or we could say like maybe African Americans. Here we have the green group, or we could say like Hispanics. And here we have the white group, maybe we could say Caucasians. So I break everyone into these groups. And then within these groups, I say, okay, now I'm going to do a simple random sample within the group. So within these group of African Americans or Reds, um, I'm only going to take five people. And so maybe I put all the African Americans in a hat and I draw five um, African Americans and those are the five people that are going to be included in my study. Then I do the same thing. I come over down here to the green group or let's say the Hispanics and I put all of them in a hat and again I pull out maybe five of them. And then I do it again over here with the white group or the Caucasians, everyone in a hat and I pull out five. Now my sample includes five African Americans, five Hispanics, and five um, Caucasians. That way, I'm for sure, for sure, I know for sure that I'm going to get a good sample or a representative sample from each type or each ethnicity um, in my study. Now, why is that important? It, it could be and it could not be. But the thing is, with a, just a plain, simple random sample, all of these people, all of them would be in one big hat. And I would pull out, let's say, 15 names. It is very possible with the simple random sample that all 15 names were Caucasian. It's very possible that I got no African Americans and I got no Hispanics. And so if my study is important to, or if ethnicity is important in my study, or if ethnicity could have caused differences or it could show something differently in my study, I want to make sure that I'm getting you know, a little bit of each ethnicity. Um, so that's why stratified sampling is important. If you, if your groups differ in some important way, if they're, if they're different, like it might not be ethnicity, maybe it's um, socioeconomic status, how much your family makes. If those groups differ and that differ, difference is important to your study, then a stratified random sample would be good for you. Next, we have a cluster sample which is very similar to stratified. Again, you're going to break your population into smaller groups. Now, the difference is that within these groups, these groups mimic the population. In other words, instead of having a, a group of all black students, you're going to have a black, a white, a Hispanic, uh, Asian, whatever. You're going to have each person or each, um, each ethnicity represented in each cluster or maybe each 
class of social economic status represented each cluster. Once you break them up into these groups where each group represents the entire population, then I do a simple random sample to choose from to actually pick the entire cluster. So instead of picking five from this group and five from that group, I'm going to pick the entire group. So you see here we have all these little groups and using my simple random sample I pick this group and I also pick this group. And so that again makes sure that ensures that I get a good sample of the actual population. Um, another way of looking at that is like if I wanted to get a study of, um, I don't know, people in Atlanta. And so instead of like trying to do a simple random sample of every single person, maybe I say, okay, well, I'm going to do it by county. And I throw all the counties in a hat and I pull out the hats and I pull out, let's say, Cobb County. Well, I'm going to survey everyone in Cobb County. And then maybe I pull out, uh, I don't know, Gwinnett County. Well, then I'm going to survey everybody in Gwinnett. The key to it is that once I pull out that group, I'm surveying everybody in that group. Next, we have systematic sampling. Again, not used that often, um, but this is where you have an actual rule to pick your sample. An example of this would be like every fifth person in a line or every uh, fourth person in a line. A lot of times this is used like when something is already listed for you. Um, maybe like the phone book. Maybe you open the phone book and I say I'm going to choose every hundredth person to call. Um, that would be an example of systematic. Not really um, the best way to do it. Because again, if you choose to do every hundredth person, that means that 101 person never had the opportunity to take part in the, the study. Um, there was no way that they would ever have been chosen to be in the study. So we typically don't use systematic, but it is a sampling method. Uh, next, we have voluntary response sampling. Um, and this sampling method, just like your convenience sample, is not, um, it's not very, uh, it's not used that often, and it's not used, and I won't even say it's not that used that often, it's just not ideal, because again, it leads to bias, and we'll talk about bias at the end of this lesson, um, but basically, when you do, when you have a voluntary response sample, the people that are volunteering themselves are people that have strong opinions, um, so like, for instance, if you're watching TV and it says, oh, call in, and let us know how you th what you think about blah blah blah. Well, if you had a bad experience, a super bad experience about it, well then you're probably gonna be the one to call in. I think about this like like rate my professor. Uh, you know, you go on to rate my professor and you're checking out your teachers. Well, the kids that the students that had you know your average experience, it wasn't bad, it wasn't great. You know, it was what it was. They're not going on there and they're not saying what they want to say. You're either going to get the people that really, really, really love the class or you're going to get the people that really, really, really hated the class. So to me, you know, the results of that or what you see on like Great My Professor, it's not that accurate. It's not it's not that good because, again, is I mean, these people, the people that are going on are the people that feel really strong about whatever it is. All right, so with that being said, we collected, we got our sample, we collected our sample using whatever sampling method we decided to use or whichever sampling method was best for our study. And then we start, we start analyzing or collecting the data. So with that, we have statistics and we have parameters. A parameter is the values or the numbers or the information that we find from the population. So again, a parameter comes from the population. Whereas the statistic, that's the number or the information that we collected from the sample. Now, the way I like to remember that is P for parameter goes with P for population, and S for statistic goes with S for sample. So P, parameter, population, S, sample, statistic. All right, so for example, it says which of the following is a statistic and which is a parameter. First one, 57% of the teachers um, at Central High School are female. Well, here we're talking about teachers at Central High School. So we're looking at all teachers. It didn't say that it was just like a small group. 
it was all the teachers at Central High School, which tells me that, hey, this is population. We're looking at the entire population of Central High School teachers. And out of that population, 57% were female. Well, since it was a population, this has to be a parameter. And B, it says in a sample of 100 surgery patients who were given a new pain reliever, <clears throat> excuse me, 78% of them reported significant pain relief. Well, here, very first thing it says in a sample, that means we're not looking, oh, excuse me, we're not looking at um, the entire population of surgery patients. We're only looking at 100 of them. And so since that 78% that reported significant pain relief came from this sample, 78% of the sample, um, this has to be a statistic. So again, A is a parameter, B is a statistic. All right, so in our data analysis, we have what we call individuals. That's the objects um, that we're describing or that we're finding information about. So that's like your people, your animals, your things, whatever you're trying to find the information about. And then you have a variable, which is a characteristic of the individual. Like, for instance, it could be gender. It could be ethnicity. It could be how many shoes you have, um, your age. Those could be variables of, of the individual. Now we have two types of variables. We have qualitative variables and we have quantitative variables. Qualitative variables, so this one over here, qualitative, puts people into categories. Um, for instance, gender, you're either a male or a female. You're in the male category or you're in the female category. Or it could be, um, I don't know, favorite color. You either like red, you like blue, you like orange. You're in a category based on what you like. So that's qualitative, whereas quantitative variables um, has some type of numeric value. All right, so like your age, um, your, I don't know, how many shoes you have. All right, and so the way I think about it is quantitative variables, yes, it's numeric, but, not, but more than that, it is anything that you would actually want to calculate some type of statistics on so any anything that I would want to find the mean about or anything that I would want to find the median about that is a quantitative variable um, don't be deceived not everything that is numeric is quantitative for instance um, social security numbers all right or zip codes uh, zip codes are definitely qualitative and they're qualitative because zip codes places you in a particular location based on your number. It wouldn't make sense for me to find the average zip code. What does that tell me? It doesn't tell me anything. The zip code is just a number that's giving you a location. Or again, like social security numbers. I wouldn't want to take that social security number and find the median social security number. What does that mean to me? It means absolutely nothing because social security number is just basically giving you information about yourself. It's putting you in a category um, Particular numbers mean particular things like where you were born. Um, you can figure that out by looking at the social security number. So again, zip code, social security numbers, those are all qualitative. Whereas, like, again, um, your age would be quantitative because it would be useful to know the average age of the students in my class. All right, so here's an example. It says a pollster asks a group of six voters about their political affiliation. Republican, Democrat, or Independent, their age, and whether they voted in the last election. Um, the, revol the results are shown in the following table. So it says, how many um, individuals are there? Well, it says we have a group of six voters who participated in the study. So we have six voters. Um, then it says identify the variables. Well, the variables, very easy from the table, is just the stuff at the top. It's your political affiliation, your age, and whether or not you voted in the last election. And the last question says, what are the, what are the data for individual three? Well, for individual three, I'll come down to my table right here. We have this person is a Democrat, age 21, who did not vote in the last election. All right, next we have qualitative variables where, again, qualitative variables are putting stuff into categories, and we have two particular types of qualitative variables. First one is ordinal. Ordinal basically is a variable that has a natural ordering. Um, anything where it makes sense to order it, put it in a particular order, that's ordinal. 
Whereas nominal, there's no natural ordering, like gender, who cares? This is male or female, female or male. There's no natural order to that. So for example, which of the following var variables are ordinal and which are nominal? State of residence. Well, I live in Georgia, she lives in Florida, he lives in California. There's no order to that. It doesn't matter whether I said Georgia first or California first. It has no meaning. The fact that I said Georgia first, it has no meaning. The fact that I said California last, it doesn't matter. So that means that state of residence is nominal. Gender. B, gender. Um, male, female. I think I said this one earlier. Well, again, it doesn't matter whether I said male, female, or female, male. There was no natural order to that. So again, that's nominal. C says letter grade in a statistics class. A, B, C, D, or F. That is ordinal. It has a natural order. I wouldn't come in first day and say, oh, you can get an A in my class, you can get a D in my class, you can get a B, and you can get an F. No, the, the natural order in saying that would be to say you can get an A, B, C, D, or F in my class. Or I, even if I said it backwards, it still has that natural order. F, B, C, B, A. Again, it just ha you say it in order because the, the letters actually mean something. Um, so that would be ordinal. And then the last one, the size of um, soft drinks or a soft drink ordered at, at a fast food restaurant, small, medium, large. Again, that's ordinal. Um, the actual values mean something. Small, medium, large. It has a natural order to it. The smallest, the next, and then the next. Um, so again, the last two are ordinal. Next, we have quantitative variables. Again, we talked about that a little bit already. Um, they're numeric. There are variables that you would actually want to calculate something on. Um, we actually have two types of quantitative variables. We have discrete variables and continuous variables. A discrete variable is anything that has a finite um, like value. For instance, how many shoes do you have? I have one pair of shoes. I have two pairs of shoes, three pairs of shoes. I cannot have 5.2 pairs of shoes. That doesn't make sense. So pairs of shoes, how many shoes you have, is discrete because it takes on that that list of values one two three four five six and so on um, so that would be discrete whereas continuous can have a value within the entire interval like how long does it take you to brush your teeth in the morning it could have taken you five minutes and 32 seconds it could have taken you two minutes and 48 seconds within a particular interval it could have taken you any any one of those times so that would be continuous. The way I think about it is discrete is typically whole numbers. Continuous, you you can't have their uh, decimals. It's, it's okay to have a decimal. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so example, which of the following variables are discrete and which ones are continuous? The age of a person at his or her last birthday. Well, their age at their birthday should be a whole number. That should be like 47 or 36 or 21 or 12. That would be discrete the height of a person that should be continuous because you can be 5.252 you can be 67 you could be 39 um you can be any of those values within a particular interval and really you could be like five five and a half if you want to or five five and a quarter so that's continuous because i have i can be any one of the values within an interval the number of siblings a person has would definitely be discrete because, again, I can have one sibling, I can have five siblings, I can have ten siblings, but I can't have 2.2 .2 siblings, 2.7 siblings. That doesn't make sense. So it's a discrete because it's, it's a whole number, and I can't have any value within the interval. It has to be that specific whole number. And then the last one, the distance a person commutes to work. Well, their distance could be continuous because I can go five miles and... I don't know, 12 feet, I can go 6.2 miles, I can go 8.7 miles, um, I can go 7.2346729 miles, any number within a uh, particular interval I can actually go or travel. Um, so again, that would be continuous. Alright, the last thing we need to talk about is our bias. And in our study, and we talked about it a little bit when we're collecting our sample, but in our studies, we want to try to eliminate as much bias as possible. That could be from collecting the sample. That could be the way that we ask the questions once we start um, 
you know, actually getting into the actual study, we want to try to reduce the amount of bias. Uh, we want as much of an unbiased um, study as possible so that our results are actually, actually accurate. Uh, if you have a bunch of bias in your study, your, your results won't be accurate. So looking at a couple of different types of bias, we have voluntary response bias. We talked about this with the voluntary response surveys. People with strong opinions are more likely to participate. That means when we, when we run a study using voluntary response, our data is going to either be extremely inflated or extremely deflated, depending on what the question is asking. So again, we want to try to reduce this bias, whereas so we wouldn't want to have a voluntary response survey because again, we know that we're going to introduce this type of bias into the study. We have what we call a self-interest study or bias, excuse me, and this bias happens when usually when the person who's running the experiment have some type of um, incentive for the experiment to go a certain way. You see this a lot of times with um, like maybe a doctor who created a medicine or some kind of cure and they're running a study to see if it actually works. Well, they have a, a, a reason. They have a incentive to make the study, the study work. They want good positive results because it's, it's what they created. They want to see that it's actually working. They want to see that it, it, it's actually helping, you know, people get healed or get better from whatever, um, whatever disease they have. Um, so that would be a self-interest um, bias. Um, you also see that a lot of times in these little small studies, like I see it all the time at my, at my school. You know, the principal's like, oh, I ran a study and they said that, you know, this new thing that I implemented is working very well. It probably didn't say that you wanted to say that, so you probably skewed the data to say what you wanted to say. Um, so that's your self-interest bias. Then you have your social acceptability bias. This one is huge um, because when people are afraid to actually answer the question um, because they know it might reflect poorly on them or you might look at them differently or you might have some type of um, thoughts about it, that's where this bias comes in. For instance, if I asked all of you guys right now, uh, how many of you guys do like my class? I'm asking a question. I'm your teacher. I'm in control of your grade. Nine times out of ten, y'all are probably going to say, I like the class. Now, you might get a couple people here and there who are um, okay with being honest. Um, and then you might get some people that, just to be funny, say, no, I don't like the class. But nine times out of ten, the amount of people that say that they like my class is going to be way higher than what it should be because I was the one that asked it. Another one is, like, when people go out and they say, hey, did you vote in the last election? Everyone knows how important voting is. Everyone knows that this last election was a major, major, major election um, for our society. If you didn't vote, you would probably not want to tell them that you didn't vote. You'd probably want to say, yeah, I, I voted. Because you don't want people to look at you negatively. All right, next we have leading question bias. And that's where the wording of the question makes you answer answer um, the question in a particular way. For instance, if I, could, if I said, um, the food quality in the cafeteria has been going down in the last couple of years. Um, what's the likelihood that you'll that you'll eat in the cafeteria this semester? Well, I just told you that the food quality was bad, so I'm already telling you that the food's nasty. Nine times out of ten, you're probably gonna be like, I probably won't eat in there because it's nasty. I'm suggesting to you, to, I'm suggesting in the way that I worded the question for you to say, no, I won't eat in there. And so again, when I when I actually do my study and I collect my data, my data is probably going to be skewed towards more people not wanting to eat in there than it should be based on how I worded that question. All right, next we have our non-response bias. Non-response is when you can't contact people or people refuse to participate. So like that would be like people walking down the street, knocking on your door, trying to get you to participate in a study. And you look out the little peephole and you see some guy with a, you know, clipboard or something like that. And you're like, I'm just not going to open the door because I don't want to be bothered right now. Um, that would be non-response. You're choosing um, not to participate. You're refusing to particip participate. Or um, 
maybe your phone doesn't work and people are calling you to participate in the study, or you can't be contacted, that's non-response bias. All right, and the last one we have is our sampling bias, and that's where the researchers actually at fault in the way that they sampled um, the population. And so a lot of people weren't included because of the way they sampled. For instance, I could be calling people out of a phone book, but I only called them between 12 and 2. Um, well, that's a sampling bias because now I'm not, I'm probably not getting any of the people that work 9 to 5. Um, I'm missing that whole group of people. I'm missing students who are at school. I'm missing a bunch of people. Only people I'm catching in my in my actual study are the people who are home between 12 and 2, which are people like stay-at-home moms, um, older people that are retired, stuff like that. I'm not really getting a good representation of the entire population.